Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Derek Watson, the angry dentist. It's Monday the 24th of April. Oh, that means yesterday was St George's Day, which I missed. Don't normally miss that. Mind you, I used to have an uncle called George whose birthday was around St George's Day. So I used to, he passed away last year, so probably used to take more notice of it than uh, than I need to now. How are you anyway? All right. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to start off with such a downer. At least I got the day and the date right. Unlike last week. This week's an exciting week. You'll never guess where I'm going. Did you guess? No, you never guess. Let me give you a clue. <laughs> That's right, boys and girls. I'm going to Peppa Pig World. Yes! <laughs> For a day or two. Or two days or three, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, I'm going to go and meet my hero, Daddy Pig. And I'm going to go and jump in some muddy puddles. So everybody who's been tells me it's absolutely fantastic. The only, uh, the only slight downside is that they actually won't let you in unless you're accompanied by a small child. So I'm going to have to take my granddaughter. Uh, but uh, I'm sure she'll find something to do while I'm off looking around the attractions. So, probably not quite so many uh, angry videos this week, but then that's not really a bad thing. I uh, read a, I had a friend who was, I think he wasn't a, G, he wasn't a GP, he was a sort of a qualified counsellor and he did addiction counselling and uh, his father was one of the very first people to do like a blog just on the internet and uh, it was more like a diary and uh, it was you know it was quite interesting because you could sort of get into the old brain the, the old mindset of a senior addiction counsellor not that he did much you know he didn't say much about the patients or anything but uh, you know he's you know like everyone's got a story haven't they and his story was quite interesting but it turned out that he was like he's a rabid Margaret Thatcher supporter I mean as in Work, work Margaret Thatcher and how wonderful she was and all the things she did, how wonderful she was into uh, into absolutely everything. Every comment. A bit like me with Bitcoin. <laughs> There's always a relevance. Bitcoin's always relevant to everything. But uh, after a while it sort of got a bit boring, you know, because you thought, oh, I know, I know where you're, I know what your angle on this is going to be, you know. And, uh, I don't know how to avoid that. I, you know, those of you who sort of been watching these videos have probably already watched enough to know what my general philosophy is. You know, scientific, rationalistic, neoliberal, the crypto anarchist, uh, and uh, you know, which is a fairly straightforward view viewpoint on everything in life. You know, just don't touch it if it's nothing to do with you. Just don't touch it. But um, yeah, so so uh, and of course, when you start doing these things, the the earlier ones, you sort of get the various bees off your bonnet, don't you? You know, uh, quickly. So so then you perhaps you don't have so many such interesting things to say. Well, I tell you what, I would like to just talk about a bit today, and that is the association, the the uh, dental fusion organisation, because. These are these videos are really um, a member benefit, you know, and they're one of the 
The other and the, and the more major member benefit is obviously is the ability to sort of communicate with the association uh, generally by email if you have a problem. Um, but that tends to be more on an ad hoc basis. So if anyone's got a problem, I think we had uh, somebody, uh, there certainly is somebody with an email in my inbox waiting about, oh that's right, there's a guy who's, um, there's a guy who made a set of dentures for a patient and then uh, when they, the lab lost the lower denture and so he fitted the upper and God knows how, I mean I don't know, he must have, the patient must have been wearing the new upper and the old lower or the old upper and the new lower or something, I forget. And uh, then uh, they looked everywhere at the lab and they couldn't find it and so, um, and then he left. It was a corporate. I'm not going to name the corporate because I think they're all equally bad. It seems to, it seems unfair to pin the blame <laughs> on any particular corporate. So for, for the corporate, read all corporates. And um, so then he left the corporate and then of course, you know, it then became nobody's responsibility to sort this out um, to the extent where um, and then the corporate sort of withheld some money from him on the basis that he'd been, had an exercise sort of due care and attention in the treatment of this patient. Um, and sort of tried to penalise him. But, and presumably the laboratory was approved by them, because oh, I don't know many corporates that will just let you use any old laboratory of your choice. So, um, yeah, so I think they're withholding 1,500 quid or something, which for a single denture, that you know was mislaid through no fault of his. Uh, it seems to be just entirely disproportionate, and you never know when these things are going to happen. You know, you you're one minute you're sailing along nicely, and the next minute you're stuck on a reef, and no, you know you need a tug to get you off. And oh, that didn't come out right, did it? Anyway, you know what I mean. Junction of death. Hang on. Oh, quite a junction of death today. So, um, yeah, so it's sort of there but for the grace of God and all that. The Some of the things, obviously, that concern me a lot, I mean, uh, uh, you know, for those of you sort of not familiar with the association, it, it sort of, its history goes back to 1954, when it was formed really out of all the dentists who were dissatisfied with the deal that the sort of the consultant-led British Dental Association got out of the National Health Service in 1948. So six years later they were all, you know, fed up and uh, and they organised and, uh, you know, and were quite a formidable force and uh, without government patronage I think they probably would have been a viable alternative to the British Dental Association but the government has steadfastly refused to recognise any association other than the British Dental Association. Um, which is a deal which I don't think benefits anybody. It benefits the government. I think the government are the only people that benefit. It doesn't, although on the face of it you think it might benefit the BDA, and I think they certainly think it does, the reason why it doesn't is because they are, you know, the other side of that deal, the sort of the unspoken tacit part, the other side of that agreement is that they are, they don't, take too firm a stand against the government and so by sort of falling down in their primary duty which is to represent the dental profession and the patients that we treat on terms and conditions and clinical standards and things like that they are ineffective you know they cease to do what they were supposed to do um, they cease to do what they state that they they do do and what the government says that they do do they just don't do it and they don't do it because there's this sort of Damocles hanging over them all the time that if they are, you know, cause too much trouble, then their patronage will be withdrawn. You know, their monopoly, their monopolistic status, which is enshrined in statute, will be reconsidered. And I mean, there's not much of a threat, but I mean, you know, it's enough to, the government's pushing an open door in effect. Whenever the government does anything, it's pushing it against an open door. 
And of course the profession's done incredibly badly out of this and the uh, patients have done incredibly badly out of it because the patients are always the one, they were the always, you know, I mean at the end of the day, dentists are still earning 130 grand a year. So you could argue that they're not doing that badly out of it. But uh, the patients, and this was a point that I, that I failed to make last week when I was talking about dental pay. You know, and the, Na the NASDA figures that showed that most dentists earn 130 grand a year before tax, um, whether they're working in the private sector or the, or the public sector. And, then, and that raised a big question about why, how is an NHS dentist who is, you know, paid so much less? And I, I always reckon like one third of the fee was, was about the ratio. I mean, I really, I don't know what it is now. I mean, you take, um, I mean, a typically a private crown would be five, six hundred pounds in the south. Uh, an NHS crown is, is what, twelve UDAs, and if you take a UDA to be about twenty-five quid, just to make the maths easy, then that's about three, three hundred quid, isn't it? Um, you know, so that ratio has gone down. The the amount that. Uh, the ratio between the average, what, what the average private practitioner is charging in fees and what the NHS practitioner is receiving in fees has gone down, but I still don't, you know, it's still half. <laughs> so it still doesn't explain how dentists are earning the same amount of money before tax. And I think the, the answer is that, is that the, the, the wages aren't variable. And by which, you know, to, to just explain that, what I mean is that if the government cuts fees in the hope that they're going to cut wages, then they won't. Wages is the last thing they will cut. The, the dentists, you know, without gaming the system, just working entirely within the system, the game that they are given to play, have decided that if anyone's going to get any less money, it's not them. So... You know, so so let's you know to put it very simply, if you were to halve the fees on the National Health Service in the hope of halving dentist income from 130 to 65 grand a year, you, that is the last thing you would do. All you would do is halve the amount of dentistry you've got. The dentist would still earn 130 thousand, but they would do, they would spend half as much on doing the work. Okay, I know obviously the ratio is not exact. You get my idea. It's like uh, it's like Einstein's uh, breakthrough when he realised that uh, that uh, it wasn't uh, distances were constant. It was the speed of light that was constant, and it was the distances that, that varied. You know, and that's the that's the thing that the government hasn't, the Department of Health hasn't quite realised yet about dentistry, which is that dental dental salaries are the constant. The quality of the work is the variable, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is, you know, this is market forces at work because I've always said that dentists have um, a unique combination of skills, of manual skills, academic skills and business skills that you very rarely find in, in any other professional job. And you need all three of those to be a dentist and that's why dentists are generally very highly paid all over the world because you know you have to know your, your books you have to know your uh, you have to make uh, make it work as a business and you have to have a good pair of hands on you and the market pays a certain rate for that combination of skills and um, you know when you're paying a dentist what you're doing is you're paying paying for that skill set and then anything left over uh, goes on treatment you know um, which is why, and, and, and a lot of what's been done, you know, in the last 20 years or so has, has been all about trying to rein in the budget. Um, and, you know, what's the relationship between um, wages and, and the budget for dentistry, you know? <clears throat> the government was always, when I was negotiating on pay, they always used to say, you know, we can't, uh, 
they always used to <clears throat> distinguish between or they had a single budget and we used to tell them that you know they used to say no any money on wages is taking money out of treatment that's basically what their line was they said look we can't give you any more money for wages because it's the NHS budget is the NHS budget and at the end of the day it's it's just one big pot of money and so any you know if you want a pay rise then you're gonna to have to have a pay cut on fees now the profession's approach to that was that both should be funded adequately you're not allowed to say uh, you know I'm going to either pay you inadequately or fund the treatment inadequately one or the other you just you just decide you know or will decide and basically we're going to try and fund it adequately but pay pay inadequately you know there were two the profession tried to sort of split this up and say you know what is the right level for pay what is the right level for for fees and the government sort of in trying trying to concatenate the two to, to always trying to say that oh the two come out of the same pot um, have just ended up with an abysmal service and really not depressed NHS wages all that much because the average wage in this country is about twenty seven thousand pounds you know nationally now I uh, was uh, went out for lunch with uh, some lads on Saturday who one of whom works for British Rail and he works in signals and mainly signals repair in other words you know they, they when there's a signal failure he's part of the team that uh, that go out and and repair it and he quite happily admitted that he spends most of his day playing Battlefield 1 on his computer because if there is a job they go out and do it it takes about half an hour and then they come back and the rest of his his 10 hour shift or whatever he's spent doing nothing playing computer games and this guy's on 38,000 a year so I mean he's well above well above the national average and yet he's not producing any work he's not <laughs> I mean he's not productive do you know what I mean I mean I I can't. That that is the trouble with. Um, I mean, I suppose he would argue that he is in the private sector, and he could argue that the the value to the railway of keeping him hanging around on thirty eight thousand pounds is, uh, you know, is minuscule compared to the, the money that they lose if the signals aren't working. But I don't know. I just don't. I don't feel. It's like America. You go to America, and you, everything's so perfect over there, and you think. How can they afford this? This can't be something. There's something going on here <clears throat> behind the scenes. I can't understand how they've all got such big cars. How they all live in such big houses. How they've all got such perfect lawns. How nothing seems to need, look like it needs a lick of paint or anything. The whole the whole country's like a theme park. And of course they're doing it by exporting dollars. And I couldn't have a nurse. Say for example, I couldn't afford to have a nurse on. Thirty-eight thousand pounds. Who was spending ninety percent of her time playing, uh, you know, z uh, Zynga? <laughs> I mean, I just wouldn't do it. I would just, I would just hire her for the ten percent of the time I needed her. But uh, I don't know. You're, you're never, you know. Barry Cockroft, the old chief dental officer, he had a, I think it was a daughter who was a paediatrician or something and, um, and one of the biggest burrs up his ass was the fact that dentists that she didn't earn as much as a dentist and yet he considered that she was saving children's lives on a daily basis and what were dentists doing here he was chief dental officer in charge of all the dentists that were doing saving the odd tooth with a root treatment you know, and there were all these other professions that were, and all the relativities were all wrong. And that's why, you know, that's where, you know, a large part of the crusade against dentist wages in terms of getting people back out of retirement and women back in the profession after they've had their babies and reducing the language requirements more for dentists than doctors so that we could get dentists in from abroad. 
Um, and the big uh, Department of Health recruitment campaigns abroad, the, the deregulate, uh, deregulating the corporates so the corporates could um, recruit from abroad. That was all about depressing wages. That was all about increasing supply uh, and uh, to reduce demand and therefore um, to decrease wages. But it didn't. But it didn't work. So I haven't talked to you at all about the association. So um, assuming I'm not on my way to Pepper Work, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. I might. I might be a Pepper Work tomorrow. I don't know. If I am. I'll be having fun. All right. If not, I'll talk to you about this association then. All right. Have a nice day. Bye.